Come on, give me five. <laughs> Good afternoon. Better right this time. It is 12.05. Uh, thank you for coming to Capital Clarity. My name is Brian Mullen. I'm here on behalf of Idaho Freedom Foundation. As you know, Capital Clarity is a program that we have every week, every Thursday, here at noon, in the Lincoln Auditorium or online at capitalclarity.com. We connect you, the people, the voters, the constituents, the people who are supposed to be the real power in our government, with those who are working for us, that is, lawmakers and elected officials and you know, state government bureaucrats, people who make the government work, but they're supposed to be answerable to the people. And I said it again, I said it before, and I'll say it again. I'm so impressed with how transparent Idaho is, how accessible Idaho government is. Uh, you just walk in here into the Capitol and find somebody who represents you and have a chat with them. They won't always do what you want them to do, but uh, they're there. So uh, this is the fourth week already of the legislative session, which means this is our fourth episode of Capital Clarity. Remember, you can go to capitalclarity.com and suggest topics, although we are almost full for the year, uh, but suggest topics perhaps for next year, and also sign up to receive emails from Idaho Freedom Foundation about this and many other important issues. Uh, at the back table there, there's some information on the organization, how you can support Idaho Freedom Foundation, the 2023 Freedom Index, which shows you how your lawmakers voted. Um, and if you go online to idahofreedom.org, you can see the ongoing 2024 index. It won't be finalized until the session's done, uh, but you can see how your lawmakers are voting right now. So we have some uh, a very interesting topic today, something that I'm looking forward to learning about. And we call it sound money for the 21st century. Now, sound money, that's a debate we've been having in our country for 100 years or more. You know, what is money? What is currency? What is value? Uh, right now, your dollar bills are valuable because the government says they are. In the meantime, you have other things that are stores of value. Gold, silver, precious metals, commodities, land, ammunition. <laughs> Here in the 21st century, there's uh, also digital currencies, which are a very new and confusing concept. Uh, but they're out there being traded for thousands or millions of dollars right now. They're being used as an investment vehicle or as a store of value. Are they money, though? Are they currency? Well, I'm looking forward to finding out. Um, also on the horizon is, I'm sure you've heard of the central bank digital currency a way for the government to essentially replace our dollars with you know, ones and zeros in a computer somewhere, which would give them, in my opinion, far too much control. But I am not the expert here, so I'm going to hand it over to the people who are going to be talking with Nick West Kleinworth. He is IFS uh, policy analyst, and he has been working on budgets, uh, examining budgets, rating budgets for the spending index, uh, digging into the, the line items, and also studying digital currencies, Bitcoin cryptocurrencies, and how they might interact with policy in the future. And once he's done, we'll have Dennis Porter of Satoshi Action, Satoshi Action Fund, Satoshi Action Education. Uh, he essentially educates us on behalf of you know, the Bitcoin world, the, the crypto world, and how that might be something that can be useful going forward as citizens and as you know, people who want to be free of government control. So well, we'll hear from Nicholas first. There he is. So preparing for this speech, I was dig doing some digging into oh, yeah. how our federal government is currently managing our monetary system. And I came across a report from the Congressional Budget Office. And what that report said was that by the year 2053, our nation's uh, debt will be nearly twice the amount of money that we're bringing into our country, so twice the GDP. Um, and this, does, and this is just publicly held debt. This doesn't even account for the government buying its own debt with printed money um, and compounding that. And so I, I was thinking about this and I said, well, gosh, 2053, my daughter will be my age by that point. And think of the burden that she's going to have once our debt reaches that extreme. 
And we're not even accounting for new entitlements, new spending, um, the state of our economy at that time. We're just assuming that current trends hold to make that prediction. Um, and so a lot of you guys probably also know people in the next generation who are also going to bear the burden of this debt and bear the burden of this poor financial management that our government has uh, decided to take with our country in this direction. And so, um, and, and what's interesting about all of this is that these are the same people that want to have an increased level of control over your money. Just this last year, the IRS passed a rule that said that uh, they're going to audit all accounts that were over $600 in what they call these third-party organizations. So things like Venmo and Cash App and things like that. They're going to audit those and make sure that, that you're paying your fair share of taxes because that's what's driving inflation. <laughs> and these same people are also seeking to implement a central bank digital currency, as Brian mentioned as well. And with the central bank digital currency, they can have the power to, at a very small and precise level, monitor how you're spending your money and control how you're spending your money. It would be programmable currency. You would see things like automatic tax deductions, automatic welfare benefit payments. Um, these are all things that they want to have control over, but they're not even managing the fiat system. And so it's kind of a joke. And so, so why should we trust these people to run our money? Aren't we better stewards of our own money? That's the whole point of the free market in America. And what's the solution to this excessive government control? What do we do as Idahoans to address this? And what could this look like for us going forward? So. Today's dollar, and, and Brian will pull up a picture real quick so that we, you guys can kind of see what we're digging into. Today's dollar only purchases a fraction of what it did in years past. So looking at this chart, you can see that today's dollar, one dollar is one dollar. So you go into the grocery store and one dollar will buy um, whatever it is that you want to purchase. So let's just say package bags. That same dollar just a few years ago, in 20, 2018, only has 86% of the buying power it had back then. So that means that you get 14% uh, less groceries, 14% less gas, doesn't go as far to pay for your rent. Um, and it gets worse as you go further back. And you notice the two different colors too. That's because in between 1982 and 1984, um, federal government they redid how they calculate the spending, the buying power of the dollar. They redid uh, how to calculate the uh, consumer price index. And so it makes it difficult for us to actually compare even further back. We don't know just how badly our currency has been devalued over time. And what's even more startling is that about 1.2 million Idahoans have seen the dollar decrease in value by at least 50% over their lifetime. And so imagine when you were kids or teenagers or even in college and you're able to buy gas for 99 cents a gallon or you're able to get a whole bunch of groceries for a whole month for less than $50. Um, and so now we end up with a situation where two parents have to work jobs, both parents have to work jobs to make ends meet. And we can barely afford rent here in Boise, Idaho alone anywhere in California or um, these other states with even higher inflation. And so one of the things that, and, and our founders foresaw this too. James Madison mentioned in Federalist 58 uh, when he was talking about the importance of the coinage clause in the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution says that no state can make anything but gold and silver legal tender. And he was explaining this, and he said, the extension of the prohibition of bills of credit must give pleasure to every citizen in proportion to his love of justice and his knowledge of the true springs of public prosperity. He saw the dangers of the government being able to just print as much money as it needed to. And he saw the dangers of something that is not 
something that is based on a value that's not inherent in the thing itself. And so what we see today is a government that has gone awry. It's running away from the principles that we were founded on, and it's running away from the prosperity of the people. And so, and fast forwarding to today, technology has been our enemy to a degree. Um, the government is leveraging it against us. Central bank digital currency, as we talked about, provides for automatic tax and uh, payments. Um, in China, we see that they've implemented a central bank digital currency that's tied to a social credit score. So we do things that the government doesn't like. You don't get to be, you won't be able to buy as much, or you won't be able to buy certain things. Imagine being in a cashless society and uh, the government has decided that you can't buy that much ammunition, or you can't buy that gun, or you can't um, buy that many groceries, or your carbon footprint is a little too big, so you can't buy that extra gallon of gas to get to work for the, for the week. These are all things that are capable, that the central bank digital currency is capable of. Um, and what's even more concerning is that nothing is private. So even though the IRS is auditing all these bank accounts with anything less, anything more than six hundred dollars in transactions um, in a, in a year, if you look at a central bank digital currency, it's a public ledger. So everything is recorded by the federal government, and they monitor every dime that you're spending. And so. What, what you end up with is program purchase authority. They can tell you what you can spend, and they can tell you how to spend it and where to spend it. This has been tossed around for welfare benefits even, but it could extend to the public sector. So if they give you a welfare benefit payment for groceries or something like that, then um, it could be programmed to only be spent on those things. Now, they're saying that in the open. Can you imagine if we had it for everybody? and what they plan to do with that. So what do we do as a people? Um, and, and as Idahoans? Well, the first things first, Idaho is contributing to the federal deficit. Brad Little noted how in, in the state of the state address four weeks ago that um, we're, we're flying in the face of Washington, D.C. politics. We're not. We're not spending the way that they're spending. We're showing them how to do things the right way, the conservative way. But this couldn't be farther from the truth. He goes on later in the speech to talk about how we're going to spend $2 billion on public school infrastructure. And where does all that money come from? Well, he's going to indebt Idahoans to pay for it. Um, the same thing goes for the ARPA funds, Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act funds, and the very poorly named Inflation Reduction Act funds. Um, these are all funds that are buried in this budget and are being used for ongoing projects. They're one-time funds, supposedly, but they've been used to grow government. Just a few years ago, Idaho's budget was just, about, was just under $10 billion. Now we're looking at a budget that's well over $14 billion. This is all federal funding growth. And we ask, well, where does the Fed, federal government get all this money? Well, they've printed and borrowed it. Um, now the natural report is that all this money will then go to California, and California will spend it. But that's just not true. Just because Idaho says, no, we're not going to spend this money doesn't mean that it then goes back to a state like California. And it's just quite silly. And Another thing that Idaho, so, so with all of this in mind, Idaho should look at ways to reduce our dependence on the federal government. Just last year, I wrote an article about how the Biden administration is using their power of the purse to be able to direct public schools on how they do their transgender bathroom policies. So what he was doing was he was going to pull all the funds that our public schools are dependent upon to provide free school lunches to students if they didn't comply with what he decided should be a proper um, transgender bathroom policy. And so with 40% of our state budget dependent on federal dollars, we should 
work to reduce that. It was only a few years ago that only 20% of our, it was only a few years ago that um, our federal uh, income was half of what it is today. Um, and then another thing that we need to do is to protect our state assets. So there is money that Idaho keeps in the coffers for a rainy day. Um, and it's up to treasure, the treasurer to invest those assets to make sure that um, we're economically invested in inflation. Um, but with the rate of inflation today, those assets are very vulnerable. Um, our own Ron Nate proposed several pieces of legislation during his tenure in the legislature where we were going to allow the state treasurer to put some of these state assets in physical gold and silver. But it always gets held up in the Senate somehow, including last year. And so problems like this could help Idaho as a government be more independent from the federal government's control. But what can we do as a people as well? Well, across the nation, there has been a push to ban central bank digital currencies. And we're looking at the federal model specifically, or the Florida model specifically, excuse me. Um, and in the Florida model, basically what they did is they defined what money is in their state, and they said that central bank digital currency is not money. Now that works um, because the way that the code is written, if it's not money, it's not legal tender, and you can't spend that in the state of Florida. Um, but, but there is one problem, though. The CBDCs were never really argued to be money. They are a way to track money. They're a digital way of monitoring money and exchanging money. And so simply writing them out of the definition of money is not going to be enough for us to run away from this threat to our liberties. And so, and in a way, we're helping them make the case by defining it as not money, that it isn't money, and that um, we can run around with the coinage clause in the Constitution, and um, we can continue down this road of federal control. And so, States should not only write it out of definition of money, but they should ban state agencies from operating or even interacting with central bank digital currencies. Don't help the federal government play this game with people's money. Um, but what do you do about all the businesses? Well, this is a free market solution. I, one of the solutions that we've been tossing around here at the Idaho Freedom Foundation was to allow the market to innovate. The best chance that the free market has for running away from central bank digital currency and the, the slowness where we could take advantage of the slowness of the bureaucratic process for getting something like this through. Um, the free market is much faster and more nimble and is able to decide what's going to work best for their businesses. <laughs> this is where things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency come into play. If we propose a, a bill that would um, and capital gains taxes on spending Bitcoin as money, um, or uh, legislation that would uh, allow people to hold and mine Bitcoin and guarantee that right to hold and mine Bitcoin as a private, as a personal private property um, that you own and belongs to you, um, then we can allow businesses to then take this and run away with it. By the time a central bank digital currency comes out, it'll be obsolete. And Bitcoin and um, other digital assets are very difficult for the federal government to control. Even in communist China today, there are still Bitcoin users, even though it's been completely banned. And so what, what we're doing here is, that particularly I want to comment on the capital gains tax, um, removing that provision where you have to pay capital gains on spending Bitcoin as currency um, prevents you from having to make that calculation when you just want to buy a soda in Walmart and then account for that with the IRS. Um, and so it, it, and it effectively makes it legal tender without recognizing as official legal tender in the state of Idaho. Um, and it allows the free market to run away from the tyranny of central bank digital currency. Um, okay, so 
in, in doing all these things, this guarantees financial liberty. Um, it allows us to defend our assets. It allows us to accept market innovation. It allows us to escape this, the runaway inflation that is devaluing our savings and putting our children in a worse position going forward. And in doing this and in opening the free market and um, allowing people to uh, make their own financial choices without government oversight and government control, um, then we can preserve the future prosperity and freedom for all of our children and all future Idahoans. Um, with that, if you guys have any questions, I'll stand for any questions um, before we transition to uh, Dennis. All right, for the benefit of uh, the people on the stream, let's uh, use the microphone. Yeah. So thank you for all that information. That was awesome. Um, but uh, exactly, you talked about what we could do as a population. Do we have any bills right now being put forward about this kind of thing? Is there some you know legislators that we can call that we can talk to that we can research the bills and move something forward, or is this just new information that we need to start fighting for? Thank you for that question. Um, and to, to answer your question concisely, yes, there are actually several pieces of legislation uh, that I learned about um, over the last few weeks that are, that are floating around in, in this building that will do just this. Um, there, there are, of course, nuances between all of them, but a lot of them actually are based on these principles, and a lot of them are really great. Um, I would say reach out to, to your representative. And the, the biggest thing is trying to learn, the, the biggest challenge that we're finding that a lot of people don't know anything about the central bank digital currency or um, di digital currencies at large. And so, um, or, or even the threats that um, the central bank digital currency could pose. And so um, making sure that you're well educated on how, how these things work and, and what, it, what it means um, to, to transact in these currencies. And that's why we brought Dennis in, because he's a really great resource to, to help with that. Um, but, um, also, making sure that your lawmaker is looking into it and understanding it as well. We're, we're running into an issue where a lot of lawmakers who are normally actually pretty tech savvy um, are actually have never dabbled um, in, in this space. And so, um, make sure you reach out to your, your freedom legislators. Um, I know that uh, Representative Elaine Price is considering a bill. Um, so she's she's really um, excited about this, and then I also learned that Senator Scott Perkins is also working on something similar as well. Um, and so so things exist in this building um, that will be proposed at some point in this legislative session that will will address this specifically the threat of central bank digital currencies. So you have been on. You're on the. Digital stream. Okay, they can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, good. Good. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned that historically, uh, a country used uh, metal as the allowable tender, no tender in state. And of course, historically, gold and silver have been stores of value and exchange for thousands of years. So people have somehow hoarded, they pick or collected some of those. How can you think of any mechanism which they could use as sort of a, a, a private means of trade in case of a great disaster? Uh, of course, the central government would vigorously opposed to that, the hard to tax, and frankly, hard to inflate it to zero value as a bitter kind of commentary. But it seems like um, you have know, to have an idea of what to do with that stuff. So let me clarify that question. Are you specifically asking about um, the, the gold and silver that people already have? That's right. Um, and, and what they can do with, with that? Yes. Now, I have once used uh, what's medieval instrument called the Traveler's Letter of Credit, where people have a pile of value, like the Hanseatic League stuff, the 1400s, 1500s. And I could imagine doing that, but again, they would be vigorously opposed. Gotcha. Um, well, and, and that that is the problem, too, especially as gold and silver becomes more and more valuable relative to the dollar, relative to the goods that we're trying to purchase with it. Um, it makes it really challenging for you, let's say, if you had a one ounce silver piece that you were saving in your safe, um, and you, you can't really divide this up, you can't really spend it on anything. Um, 
what makes it really challenging without having to actually shave off plates of silver and weigh it um, to make a transaction for anything smaller than that denomination. Um, I, I'll say that if you if you look for um, there there is silver around us that that we don't realize that we're handling. So for instance, I I don't know if this was shared in, in the announcement. I'm a real big coin collector. So if you if you find quarters that are older than 1964, they're usually mostly silver and things like that. Um, so you can you can acquire smaller denominations of that. But then still, as those become more valuable, can you buy groceries with them and things like that? And that's kind of where Bitcoin kind of starts to solve that problem. Because you can actually get to very small denominations of Bitcoin. Of Bitcoin. Um, right now, I think the, the last time I looked at the price, it was about $37,000 for a whole Bitcoin. Um, but um, you can get a denomination of Bitcoin that is one ten millionth of a Bitcoin to make it very, very small. Um, and so that allows you to have something that's really valuable, something that's hard, um, and something that's stable, um, something that ha has a finite number. It's, you will never have more than 21 million Bitcoin in the world. Um, and so it, it's inflation resistant. Um, and so then you end up with, a, with, a, with an asset that has a lot of the qualities of gold and silver, but you can break it down really, really small and make practical purchases with it. Um, and, that, and this is where a lot of people go wrong um, with it, is they, they buy all this Bitcoin and go, okay, I'm going to be rich. It's going to, it's going to go up and it's going to be this asset that's going to be worth a ton of money. Um, but the problem is it's never really designed for that. It's designed to be money. It's designed to be a means of exchange. And so um, if, you, if you buy Bitcoin, then the, the idea is that you're, you're using it. It's practical. It's not something that you need to stick into the, into the safe. To answer your question directly, I, it, it's really challenging to figure out what you're going to do with your, your personal gold and silver reserves that you're holding in, in your safe. Um, but it's a good store of value for the money that you spent on those um, to exchange them for a lump sum one day. Um, I don't have the best advice on, on, on that specific question. Um, but I can say that it illustrates the, the problems with strictly using gold and silver and um, instead using uh, the digital assets instead. I think okay. I think that if that's everything, then we'll transition to. You know, and I think South Dakota they have these gold back. You know, and they have that gold and the plastic and combine the very very values amounts. Gotcha. And uh, this, I think, is allowed in like three or four states now. Mm -hmm. And if you could break it down to where you could have like a dollar amount of gold in that gold bag, up to maybe, you know, I don't know what the values are, but they vary in range where it makes it very usable in a situation like this that I was talking about here. Has Idaho considered doing anything like that? Mm -hmm. To be honest, this is actually the first time I've heard of something like that. Um, so but I don't think Idaho has, has that. It works, and it's, it's apparently a good idea. It, it, it definitely something to look into. Um, if you have any more questions, I'll stay after. Um, but I want to make sure that I give Dennis plenty of time to talk about his project and what he's doing across the country. This man is a machine. He is working on bills that hold these principles in 16 states across the nation. Um, he, he was originally supposed to be in person today, but something came up in one of those other states. And um, he's, he's advancing that fight for, for financial liberty across the country. So we're grateful that he still made time to join us, at least virtually. Um, and it, so, so Dennis is the president and CEO of the Satoshi Action Fund. Um, it's a relatively new group. Um, and they're doing a really great job uh, promoting financial liberty and educating people about the importance of hard money, sound money um, across the country. We've been working with them um, 
on this this particular issue uh, the last couple months, and um, I'm excited to introduce him and uh, take it away, guys. Switch over, okay, you guys can hear me. Give me a thumbs up. There we go, give me a thumbs up, okay. Uh, so hopefully you all will be able to hear me. I'm glad to be uh, on this call, and, and thank you to thank you, Nick Lawson and Brian and the Idaho Freedom Foundation. Glad to be here uh, speaking about an issue that's really important to me. I mean, honestly, Nick Lawson did an incredible job uh, covering a lot of the important information around you know, why someone might be very supportive of Bitcoin. Um, I'll try to give a little bit more information on sort of why um, Bitcoin and people who are sound money advocates, people who care about liberty and people who care about sound money would be um, you know, interested in Bitcoin. Uh, but it's probably good to start with a little bit about some of how money works uh, right now today. Um, currently, you know, we really sort of have one dominant form of money in the United States. That's a dollar, right? We all are sort of very aware of that. But um, you know, a long time ago, I don't know really that long a time ago from a historical perspective, but um, you used to be able to convert uh, dollars to, to gold, right? And then eventually they sort of broke that convertibility. Um, but gold was money for thousands of years, and it was money for thousands of years. It still is money today for many across the world. Uh, just not so dominant in our way that we spend money on a, on a daily basis. Um, but the reason why gold became so popular and so widely used across the entire planet as a form of money and why it was typically associated when it was used as a form of money when when countries would back their currencies with it they would see you know pretty significant improvements in their gdp and in society broadly um i, I would without presenting the entire argument here um, you know i sort of believe that when you have sound money when you have a money that's consistent it allows people to better plan for the future and when people can better plan for the future you sort of see um, a, a more dynamic society um, but the reason why money was uh, sort of gold was such a great money for society is because it had very important characteristics it still has very important characteristics um, those characteristics being that it's uh, divisible it's fungible it's durable, um, extremely durable, very limited supply, also really important here. Um, portability is the one that's a characteristic of money, which gold is, you know, was more very pretty portable until we got to the digital era and we started to see the breakdown of gold, um, even just predating the digital era um, slightly too as well. We started to see the breakdown of gold used as money because it was hard to move around um, as the economy started to, to speed up. Uh, and then the last characteristic there is accept, um, acceptability. So, you know, in order for money to work, you know, the person on the other end of the bargain needs to accept the money that you're trying to give them. So gold was very, very uh, solid money for a very long time for these reasons. Um, eventually, of course, we moved on to the dollar, right, where uh, the dollar was supposed to back gold and then eventually we moved to this sort of um, faith and trust system where the dollar is not backed by anything. So the dollar today, uh, but still has a lot of these characteristics, you know, it's, it is visible, it is fungible. Um, durability, well, you, know, you could probably say that it's less on the durability side. And limited supply, that's sort of the really big problem that occurred more recently in history. Um, uh, whereas, like, in fact, predating the breaking of the dollar convertibility, you know, you could say that there was a limited supply of dollars, but we've, certainly, we've moved to the system now where clearly there is, you know, no limit to the amount of dollars that this country and especially other nations are willing to print of their own local currencies as well. Uh, and then lastly, portability. I mean, portability was really what caused, in my opinion, paper currency to surpass gold because it allowed it to be more, much more accessible and move much quicker um, as the global economy took off. We needed a money that could help to improve the speed of trade. And a lot of our economies, at least definitely in the short, medium term, have always benefited from that, that speed. Uh, it's that limited supply component now where that we deal with where you see um, very serious problems arising. So so that's you know you know very brief slightly butchered history of, of money. I am I'm not the, the expert historian in the room. I'm sure some could probably give me a, a fine critique on that one. Um, but just generally speaking, you know it's really important to understand the different components of money and, and why they are. So moving on to um, 
to Bitcoin, it's really important to understand that um, Bitcoin also carries a lot of those characteristics. It, the one thing that it really is changing, in my opinion, that makes it a sort of um, revolutionary and and feels foreign maybe to some people, like, you know, this is a totally different thing. It's a, it's a total leap to a different direction. Um, it feels that way, in my opinion, mostly because of the nature of it not being physical, something you can hold. I hear this really commonly amongst my friends who are very big sound money advocates that are Bitcoiners that commonly when they go and they talk to their um, friends and family that are sound money advocates, uh, gold and silver particularly, they have this struggle with this, this direction that we're going where there's no physical nature to the, to the money system. So um, that, that I understand, you know, we can get into um, sort of a long conversation on, on how the, the lack of physical nature of money is could be seen as an improvement, but well, we'll keep that to the side right now because it's a lengthy debate between the sound money folks and, and the Bitcoiners. But ultimately, what I think we, what I'd like to have uh, the audience focus on is those other features that Bitcoin presents and that it mirrors in other types of money. And that being that Bitcoin is extremely divisible. So you can, you know, they, Nick Law said earlier, there's 21 million Bitcoin, right? Well, each Bitcoin is divisible by 100 million portions. Which are called Sats or Satoshis, and just so you know, the reason why we throw around, the reason why our name is Satoshi Action, why we say Satoshi Sats, uh, the originator, the founder of Bitcoin, is um, their online name was Satoshi Nakamoto. Of course, to this day, we, we still don't know who that person or that group was, uh, but uh, that's where that name comes from. So uh, extremely divisible, 100 million, which means there's 2.1 quadrillion Sats um, floating around. Eventually, once all the Bitcoin is issued. We're at roughly 19 million plus Bitcoin that's been issued so far, um, and then we'll see more Bitcoin issued. And it's a, that's another important kind of feature that I'll jump into real quick with Bitcoin as well, to keep, just to keep in mind. There is no inflation rate of Bitcoin. Um, even gold and silver you know, sort of have some sort of continuous inflation rate. Like there's always more gold and silver being found. Um, even if we were to discover all the gold and silver on this planet, like we could move from planet to planet and continue to find the substance throughout the universe. That is not true with Bitcoin. With Bitcoin, there is a perfect 21 million supply hard cap, never going to change. Um, and so as, as it's being issued, once it gets to that 21 million, that issuance will just stop. So it's not considered an inflation rate um, or um, a supply increase. It's just, there is a certain amount of supply and that will be issued over a given period of time. Um, another component to, think, uh, to consider when it comes to Bitcoin's characteristics and why it's such a good money, um, is its uh, portability. And that's really a big one for where we're trying to go as a society, because we want to maintain these great characteristics of gold and silver, um, where your, your value is protected through a limited supply uh, and, and through a money that can't be debased, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and so as, as you move to Bitcoin, you, you maintain those characteristics of sound money, but yet you increase portability. You allow this money to be sent globally anywhere to anyone with an internet connection, um, 24 seven, 365, the network never goes down um, for you know a minimal fee. So it's imagine it's almost like you've digitized gold. That's what people call it oftentimes. You may have heard that line before that Bitcoin is digital gold. The characteristics of gold have been, has been digitized. Almost imagine it's like going from physical um, you know, photos that you would hand to each other and you would take pictures and see it because you could touch it to, to digital photos. That's what happened to um, photography over the last you know, 20, 30 years. No one really prints, very few people print uh, pictures anymore, right? We send them digitally, we receive them digitally, uh, we take them digitally. Uh, and yet that seems very normal, but when it comes to money, it, it, it seems like a little bit more of a leap for people, but it is the same exact process. We are digitizing um, gold and the characteristics of gold. Really, the only thing we're leaving behind is the physical nature, so to speak. Um, so, okay. So, I hope um, I hope I'm keep, everyone's keeping track so far um, and understanding the values of of sound money being digitized and transitioned into what we call Bitcoin today. Um, there are more characteristics we could go over all of them, but I don't want to uh, waste too much time and I'm going to leave a good amount of apple time uh, for questions. So, again, you found we've discovered the or talked about the, the features of sound money. We talked about how Bitcoin has has mirrored that. 
But let's talk a little bit about also some of the values that Bitcoin can add to, to Idaho in particular, outside of just uh, the money itself. The money itself is great, and the payment network it resides on is fantastic as well. Um, but there's also physical infrastructure that is built in order to maintain this new digital money. Just like how we have data centers today for maintaining the internet. I mean, for me to be able to call and zoom in would have been, you know, people would have thought that unthinkable just 30 or 40 years ago. And now because of the data center infrastructure, the internet infrastructure that we have today, um, what was once thought unthinkable is happening just regularly every single day. Um, so in order for that to happen, though, you need those data centers. In order for you to send cat videos, to watch uh, YouTube, you name it, all of these things are possible because of that data center infrastructure. Well, Bitcoin needs the same type of data center infrastructure, except it's very unique. Um, it's an interesting type of data center where it only does one specific thing over and over and over again. And that is, it just continues to secure the Bitcoin library. I can get a little more technical on what that means, but ultimately Bitcoin mining, which is the data center infrastructure that supports Bitcoin, it secures the Bitcoin network and also helps to trans the, help the transactions to flow across the network as well. Um, and because it's only doing one thing over and over and over again all the time, these data centers are able to provide unique energy benefits to your city, um, being that they can wind down at any given time and deliver energy back to the grid when it's needed the most. Uh, they can mitigate methane emissions, um, and they can also provide jobs in very rural parts of the country. And I'll briefly say why, and then um, I will sort of mention a couple components on um, the legislation we have putting forward, and then I, I'll stop so we can have answer a few questions. And of course, at any time, if you want to reach out to me, I'd be happy to talk um, further at length about these things. So those, those values, those benefits that the Bitcoin mining data center infrastructure can add to Idaho, um, there's really three that are super important in my, in my opinion. One is that a grid balancing, method mitigation, and also the ability to provide jobs and economic investment into local jurisdictions. So the grid balancing one is really interesting because it's, it's happening all over the place already today. There's, there's not just uh, you know anecdotal evidence. We have you know peer-reviewed research coming out now that shows that these things are happening and that they, they're, they're backed up by uh, credible evidence-backed research as well. And the way it works is like, Here's, here's a quick example. So in Texas, um, over the last several years, a lot of Bitcoin mining has moved into that state uh, for a variety of reasons. But ultimately, when they when they moved there, they plugged into the grid and they signed up for various types of grid balancing programs that are made available for the energy systems there in the state. And um, when winter storm Elliot came down, polar vortex, you know, all over the news, shut down, uh, was, was poised to shut down a lot of electrical infrastructure in the state. Bitcoin miners wound down their energy consumption and delivered roughly 1,500 megawatts of power back to the grid, which is a non-trivial amount of energy. 1,500 megawatts of power is enough power to heat 1.5 million small homes. It's enough energy to power 300 large hospitals. And it's all happening right in the middle of when this winter storm is happening, when everybody else in the state is cranking up their heat, you know, trying to stay safe, they're trying to stay warm. The miners are there to deliver that energy back. Um, and they don't do it out of the goodness of their own heart, I will, I will admit, it is a uh, economic incentive that they're the grid offers to those, um, those types of data centers. It's, it's made available to everybody, but it just so happens that Bitcoin miners are even better at it than anybody has ever been before in uh, throughout history. And we have a little paper on this, I'd be happy to, to share if you want to get into the nuts and um, bolts of it. Really, really big value out of the grid there, um, especially as we move to more intermittent energy assets, if your grid there in Idaho, have you been seeing any uh, wind and solar being added? Um, those are intermittent energy assets. They have a huge, um, what I call sort of complication with them, where you know they're not an on-demand energy source. So when the wind is blowing, the sun is shining. It's not always wind. You might want to turn your, you know, your heat on or your air conditioner on, um, and that's a big problem for the grid. We need energy when we sort of when the grid demands it. We need to deliver it. Otherwise, you can have imbalances and have browns and blackouts. And that's where these Bitcoin miners can come in and sort of create that balancing mechanism. Um, the second one being um, methane mitigation, really interesting, sort of seems like a total out of left field. How do we get from grid balancing to methane mitigation? Well, Bitcoin miners are constantly in search of very cheap energy sources. And methane is also oftentimes flared from oil and gas sites, from landfills, you name it, and it's not utilized at all. They just 
put a flare up, burn it off, and get rid of it. Well, what can, a Bitcoin miner can do is they can come in and they can use that methane as an energy source for their mining operations. They, they come in, capture the methane, put it through a generator, and they generate electricity to mine Bitcoin. And they're able to do this because Bitcoin miners are completely location agnostic. They don't need any additional infrastructure. So you can be quite literally in the middle of nowhere and have a Bitcoin miner come sit right next to that operation. Um, happy to provide some, some pictures if anybody is interested in, in the future. So, um, And then that last one, sort of obvious tie into the previous one where I said Bitcoin miners can be anywhere. Well, they tend to go, as, as I mentioned, to where energy is stranded or underutilized. Um, that could be a flare, that could be some energy asset that's sitting out in the middle of nowhere that isn't really being properly utilized. They can go in there and they can uh, utilize that energy, create local investment, and when they're doing that, you know, generally speaking, they're hiring locally in those rural parts of your state or potentially across the country. And I'm aware of source, of course, there are miners in the state of Idaho. Um, had a friend recently who was mentioning how he was investing around $10 million um, in Bitcoin mining in the state. So, so I'll pause there on, on the benefits of Bitcoin mining. I think it's just an important note because that, you know, oftentimes people talk about what are the benefits of Bitcoin and people say, oh, we already have Google, we already have silver, we already have dollars, why do we need Bitcoin? But even if you're sort of questioning the value of Bitcoin, just remember that people are using this globally. It's nearly a $1 trillion asset and I imagine it will continue to grow. And as it grows, there's going to be the we're going to need more of that data set of infrastructure uh, called Bitcoin mining. And at bare minimum, even if you're just sort of like questioning uh, the, the need for Bitcoin, people are going to use it and you're going to want to build those data centers because they have a ton of value to add to your state from an economic energy perspective and, and energy perspective as well. Um, last note here, just really briefly, I'm going to go over this super fast. There are really some super key parts to keep in mind with this legislation that, could be, that will be coming forward in Idaho. Um, the main parts of it are to just really ensure that people can use Bitcoin. We see all over the place right now, people in DC, they just sort of want to limit Bitcoin. They don't really want the free market to exist with regards to Bitcoin. And so they're trying to clamp it down. And so we as an organization are going state by state and, and ensuring that you know, the right to use Bitcoin is protected. So that bill will protect the right to use Bitcoin, access Bitcoin, and digital assets as well. Um, it'll protect your right to self-custody which means that you can custody the Bitcoin yourself. You don't have to put it in a bank or an exchange. Um, it'll protect the right to mine Bitcoin. It'll also protect the right to run a node, which is um, another part of Bitcoin data center, or another part of Bitcoin infrastructure, which we can touch on later. It's just sort of a keep apart to make sure that all the rules are being followed on a regular basis. And then also it will um, create a true dollar uh, de minimis exemption on cap gains for state cap gains, as well as exempt miners from sort of very specific money regulations, which we don't feel apply, um, and most, most people when we talk to them sort of also agree. But I'll, I'll stop there. I know that was probably a lot of information and jumped around to a lot of different places. I wanted to try to cover as much ground as I could and, and still leave a little bit of time uh, for questions. So, uh, Nicholas, uh, thank you again for letting me be a part of this. And um, to everybody that listened in, I uh, look forward to traveling to the state. I'll be there uh, coming soon to help support the effort to get this legislation put forward. Thanks, 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 Thanks. So we're still figuring out the technology with zooming in. This is the first capital player we will add somebody zoom in. So for right now, um, if you want to ask a question, just go ahead and ask it and I'll repeat it for Dennis and we can cycle through it. Go ahead. Do you have a display the difference between Bitcoin and ETF Bitcoin? It yeah. seems to be coming on online, which is if they're distancing themselves from that, they can, because it sounds like okay. like an ETF or a gold or silver. You don't actually hold it. Okay. So, so that's so the, the question. question. Let's see, let's see. You can put it in the chat too. If I mute this one there, now you should be able to ask. Okay, so that should be a little better. Okay, there we go. Um, so the question was, what is the difference between Bitcoin and the ETF Bitcoin stuff, products that you're seeing? Yeah, um, so uh, great question. You know, really at the end of the day, you can own Bitcoin or you can own an ETF, which is an IOU for Bitcoin. Um, I, I feel pretty confident if you sort of have a lot of uh, potential to own a lot of Bitcoin, maybe 
maybe diversify a little bit. There are some security risks and, and responsibility risks when you hold your own Bitcoin, just like when you hold your own gold or own silver. Uh, if you have a safe in your house, you know, you know, make sure it's locked down, protect it. Probably not going to tell people that it's there. Like, there's all sorts of steps you take to make sure that you know your gold is safe at home. Um, same component with Bitcoin. There's there's potential risks as long as you're you know fairly responsible and take the steps necessary. You shouldn't have any problem. Um, but some people that you know in the higher wealth classes, we hear people that are in the you know ten million, hundred million dollar range, where they just don't feel comfortable holding that much in um, self custody at their own on their own premise or on their own person. And so they'll, you know, they'll want to buy an ETF. And the ETF is simply just a representation of Bitcoin. So the, you know, the different ETF issuers, there's 11 of them, some of them we're talking to about trying to get states to help buy those ETFs for state pension funds. They are, um, you know, they are actually buying the Bitcoin when you buy an ETF. So they actually have to custody that Bitcoin for you. So it is held on your behalf. It's not like a fake paper, like, um, I, I can't remember the, uh, the term that's used before with the premise is that like people could sort of like buy back in the day you could buy like a representation and they didn't actually have to go out and buy that asset in the marketplace so it's sort of like a fake IMU whereas this is more of a direct uh, representation but you're not actually holding Bitcoin when you buy that you're holding that ETF um, there's definitely a lot of information out there from these issuers on on the difference though if, if someone is interested in more information on that I can, I can get that for them you have a question. Is, is he aware of any other proof of work coin on the planet? Number one. Number two, what does he assess to be the risk of a successful 51% attack on the part of combined governments? Did you catch that? Um, so uh, there's a lot of really, really good write ups on 51% attacks. I'd be happy to send you that. I'm not, I'm not a technical guy. I did my due diligence and my research on this um, a number of different times. Um, I, I, I rated at almost near zero, if not complete zero, um, that a 51% attack could happen at this point on Bitcoin, given the um, just the wide range of miners that are ge geographically displaced across the entire world. And um, the, the cost of a sustained attack, it just, I, I have a hard time believing that they would be able to do that. Um, there's also other ways, sort of nuclear options that Bitcoiners can take, users can take to protect themselves. Um, but yes, there are lots of other proof of work coins. Um, you know, Litecoin, Dogecoin, there's you know thousands of them in theory. There's probably only about five to ten that are uh, significant in the sense that they have any form of liquidity in the marketplace. I, I'm not opposed to people who want to you know try other coins and um, experiment or believe in other coins. I personally am a very very strong believer in, in Bitcoin itself. I don't see the need for too many other proof of work coins, but um, I've got friends that disagree with me, so um, I'll leave it at that. But generally, yes, I'm, I'm very aware of uh, other proof of work coins. Bitcoin is just uh, by far and away uh, roughly 99% of the market on mm -hmm. proof of work coins. I think we have time for one more question. Go ahead. So, is there a way that, like, the federal government or Department of Defense, and then you have the satellites and how all that works to keep states from? having their own Bitcoin or having access to the internet? I don't know if that's a dumb question or if I'm explaining that right. No, that's a great question. Um, so Dennis, the question was, uh, is there a possibility that if the governments have like, control the internet infrastructure that can be an obstacle for states to um, allow free Bitcoin use and access for people? I mean, uh, yeah, in theory, there's probably ways for folks to to, to limit these things, um, but just generally speaking, like Bitcoin sort of operates on its own infrastructure, so there are, um, that's, that's where the nodes come in and where the mining comes in. It's completely it's sort of independent of itself. I, I don't I don't know if I've ever heard of anybody completely theorizing of a way to successfully limit the use of, of Bitcoin over the internet. I mean, as, as, a, as a note, you know, Nick Loss mentioned earlier, I mean, you go to China and people are still using Bitcoin there, and you know, they have one of the most aggressive forms of uh, censorship among any major nation on the planet. Um, and Bitcoin mining has also survived there as well, despite being under a total ban. It's very hard to ban Bitcoin. It's kind of one of the, the notes in the, the space. There's sort of an internal joke that when you ban you know, Bitcoin in your country, you're really just banning yourself from using it. You're not really actually banning other people from using it. Is it concerning that there's a danger of quality? Okay. Um, and I think that that's... 
Thanks so much for sharing. We look forward to seeing you here in Boise. I look forward to coming. I'll be there on the 19th and um, looking forward to hanging out. And uh, as a fellow Pacific Northwesterner, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Idaho be the first Pacific Northwest state to pass some of these protections and ensure that people are able to freely use uh, Bitcoin and also push back against these CBDCs. So uh, we are very, very opposed to CBDCs at, at our organization. Uh, we have a whole one pager on it. If you're, yeah, we're interested. So thank you to the Idaho Freedom Foundation again for having me on and excited to be working with everyone um, to move freedom forward in your state. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> Excellent. So I had a few announcements as well. I forgot to plug um, Idaho Freedom Foundation on Monday is launching its sound money agenda. So we have these pamphlets in the back. Um, for you guys to pick up. Um, and it just kind of gives you an overview of what we stand for, for sound money, um, and what, what problems we've identified now. Um, and then uh, on Monday, we'll have this website up with model legislation and all kinds of resources for you guys to be able to learn more about um, the topic. So please feel free to grab a handout, grab a copy of the Freedom Index as well. Um, and I'll be around if you guys have any more questions about, about this topic. Thank you for coming to our fourth Capital Clarity this year, and uh, we hope that you'll come for more as the year goes on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.